Okay, good morning. Thank you very much for coming. So, welcome to Drone Avionics. I think there's something I can tell you. So firstly, a quick introduction to myself. I'm Dr. Steve Wright. I'm now a lecturer at the University of West of England, right here in Bristol. And I've actually only been playing this game for a couple of years. And uh, before that, as you can see from my potted CV there, I've spent a lot of time in aerospace um, over the last 25 years before starting to teach what I've learned over that time. <coughs> and I did my PhD um, as part of the midlife crisis a couple of years ago. So the main point is that, you can see, as you can see, I've moved from my Airbus days working on the very large aircraft, for example the A380, going down to the very small and got a few insights because of that, really. So, firstly, I just want to describe my terms, really, and define the sort of drones and what I mean by drones today. Um, so, a lot of us are very familiar with these sort of systems as well, the mighty Tyrannus, very impressive aircraft, and the ubiquitous Predator all over the world. And there's a whole series of other smaller drones as well, generally all military applications or, or demilitarised versions of these military vehicles. And really I'm, I'm describing these as conventional drones in the sense that they've been around for a fair amount of time so far and they've got various qualities that I'm going to talk about in a second. But what I really want to do here is to use these ideas of conventional drones and contrast them with the sorts of drones that everybody's talking about at the moment. I mean, drones are all in the news at the moment, and usually for all the wrong reasons. But the fact of the matter is they do exist. And so here's a typical cascade of those sort of, of the sort of machines you see out there. This one at the top here, it's called DJI Inspire, and generally you'll see a lot of this photography going on these days on, on YouTube and things like that. And most of the people who uh, make a living, and there are a lot of them, making a living out of aerial photography with drones, speak very highly of that machine. The Parrot AR drone here looks very sinister, but actually it's a very useful um, consumer stroke prosumer device. Now, prosumer is this piece of jargon that's sprung up in the last few years to mean slightly above toys and, and really the informed consumer as well. And in fact, I use that very drone there as part of my teaching here, here at UWE. And then it goes right down to these, what are essentially toy drones. Um, so we see this little thing down here, uh, which is very interesting, because although it's a toy, uh, the fact of the matter is I can't get a Tyrannus in here today, but I can get one of these in. So let's look at that. So you can see here, that it might be a toy, but it's also a very impressive piece of engineering. <laughs> that one's flown off right now, but never mind, you take the point. Don't worry, you get to have a go at that afterwards in the coffee break. And because of that, in fact, they're very useful teaching aids because effectively they contain all the, all the devices necessary in a, in a conventional avionics system, but in microcosm, an absolute fraction of the cost. Something else I'm going to quantify in a minute as well. So when we think about these consumer prosumer drones, and I'm going to focus on that now, it's worth breaking it up into the various components because that's really what's enabled all this stuff to proliferate in these last few years. A few key subsystems, I'm talking about the sensing systems. Now sensing generally that's position and that can involve uh, GPS, but also on a smaller scale, and we'll talk about it in more detail in a minute, um, the six degrees of freedom gyroscopic sensors as well allow these fundamentally unstable devices to be stabilised. There's some other pieces of technology as well. So the actuation, the, the, control, the, the propulsion system, and the autopilot itself. There's a telemetry link down to what is quite often a very cheap laptop or something like that using some pretty, pretty good software pretty good. I'm going to qualify that as well in a minute. But a key, few key components there, so it's very, and it's very useful to consider those different components because 
effectively, what's, what we've arrived at in the last few years is a convergence of those technologies um, to, to enable these sort of miracles we've got now at these phenomenally co low costs. So the point I really want to make here is there have been no major fundamental breakthroughs in technologies that have allowed all this thing to suddenly appear out of nowhere. And really, really what's happened, it's the old story of a whole series of technologies have progressed along their cost curves, <coughs> usually being driven by other things. So mobile phones have been a big driver um, to enable all these other things like very cheap, low-cost cameras, very cheap but very high capacity and very high current batteries, but also the software infrastructure as well, uh, the open source community. And essentially, those have converged and things have reached a tipping point, but nothing fundamental has changed. So, a bit more detail on those fundamental enabling technologies. I mean, 32, cheap 32-bit microprocessors have been around for years, but again, been ratcheted up by the smartphone revolution, another evolutionary revolution. Six-axis accelerometers, they're not perfect, they're certainly not of the same quality that we find in conventional avionics in an inertial reference system, but they're good enough to stabilise my drone most of the time. <laughs> but there's also a few other tricks as well, like pyrometers, very low-cost pyrometers. We can do an altitude estimate based on that. Low-cost GPS and ubiquitous GPS. And again, those other points about open-source software Digital telemetry links, and when I say digital telemetry links, a whole range of them. And that's one of the very useful things that's come up as well. A whole series of different modular systems that can be reused. Cameras, displays, and as I mentioned before, the, the, the ability to deliver all that and all that energy, as well as control it, uh, in a very light package. So let's look at the hardware first. So perhaps you'll hear people in, in the know talking hushed tones about the, uh, these devices called Pixhawks. You can't really see there, but it's, a, it's about yay big. About the size of a fag packet, smaller than a smartphone, and certainly a lot lighter. And inside that, I've got a few examples of some of the technology in there. We won't go into much detail. But the point there is it's not particularly high technology, it's worth bearing in mind. I mean, for example, 65 nanometer processors for that, for that microprocessor. That's kind of 15-year-old geometries. And one gigahertz, a quarter of a mega, of, a quarter of a gig of RAM. You know, that and single core processor. Yeah, again, that's kind of the sort of functionality that you saw in a mobile phone about 10 years ago. But there's also also lots of useful telemetry systems, lots of wireless links that sprung up. We've all heard of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And those have been plundered very effectively to enable all this to happen. And there's also a whole bunch of proprietary stuff as well, operating at various different frequencies with various different protocols. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. <coughs> Hardware is nothing without software. So, and this has been another very important aspect of this convergence really. We've got the level of the operating system, we need a real-time operating system, a real avionics, I say real or conventional avionics system, we'll have very very high integrity operating systems, very hard real-time. The, 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 most of these consumer drones that I'm talking about today, they're using real-time systems and for in the case of things like this free RTOS operating system guess what it's another open source thing uh, very very good performance but again not written to this of course to the same level of rigor that our conventional avionics is the languages that are being used to code these applications are also consumer derived relatively flaky good old C and C sharp C finds its way into conventional avionics, but certainly not in the sort of rather ad hoc coding fashion that's been used for these guys. So, 
there's a few very clear examples out there, and here's the very here's what's really making it all possible: open source code posted on the web on GitHub and things like that, and and this is and some very clear portable software stacks are available that can be run on different bits of hardware and configured very very quickly to control different drone airframes as well. I should stress rotary and fixed wing as well. As we also mentioned, the ground control is also important. And also that is benefiting from this whole open source thing as well. And the tools, again, open source, freely available. All of that software that I'm showing there is available at no cost to a developer. And therein lies the difference. Another enabling technology, I mentioned power as well. So we've got two aspects to it. We need to store the power, so we've got these very high power batteries. And the lithium polymer technology, essentially has been refined, developed and refined, again for mobile phones. Phenomenal power densities compared to what was available a while ago. And as well as that, very, very high current delivery, so they can also deliver the power as well when it's needed. And, de and we deliver that through these lightweight brushless motors that are, that are available relatively cheaply. So again, all those technologies have come together. So again, I started off by saying, yes, here we've got our conventional military drones usually, and our consumer drones are getting in everybody's hair at the moment. And so I claim, my, my analogy is really that military drones that we see all over the place, like the Predator is the one that we always hear about, it's effectively a decosted Eurofighter. You know, it's a, it's a conventional military aircraft. Certainly a lot, lot cheaper than a conventional military aircraft, but still in, set within an order of magnitude in cost and sophistication of those conventional ones. The AR drone and all these drones that I've been talking about now though, they're effectively decosted uh, smartphones, for better or for worse. Or you could argue it's an enhanced Raspberry Pi. And in fact that's not such a, an exaggeration, because in fact this particular board here, which is an autopilot, does a similar job to that pixel thing that I mentioned a minute ago. Uh, is actually based on Raspberry Pi hardware. So it all sounds very odd, ad hoc, and all very disorganised, but less so than you might think. Not disorganised, unorganised, or you might call it self-organised. In other words, there's a community out there bound together by the internet, and forums, and uh, sharing capabilities such as GitHub I talked about. A lot of people developing code and this has caused people to converge and in fact a lot of the code that I've been looking at and using on my drones here at, at UE, a lot of it I've been looking at it and I'm impressed. It's been well written, it's solid code, it's well done, it's well supported as well. So just because there's no hierarchical organisation governing all this. It's not, it's not to say it's all bad, or well, actually it's just not all good either. And so, some, and so because of this, because of so many people in, the, in a shared talking shop are out there, it's leading to de facto standards emerging, and that in turn is, is allowing interoperability between systems. So, so for example, this, this piece of code here, which is ground station, can operate with various different uh, autopilot software stacks because there's a shared communication link between them. And so here are two examples that implement that. And so much so that the actual organisations are starting to consolidate as well. So dread thing where I'll be in about 10 years time, but it's going to be interesting to see it. So, as you can imagine though, hang on, it all sounds very good, but surely there must be some weaknesses, and the answer is a yes, of course there are. These things are very, very crude in many ways, very sophisticated in others. They're very, they're very slow, there's 
the range is still short. The endurance is low as well. That battery technology is pretty much the limiting factor at the moment. And the battery also limits the payload that we can carry. In fact, cyber security is another issue as well. They're probably the level of cyber security that I've been seeing on some of these drones is equivalent of um, you know browser vulnerabilities that you saw kicking around in the 1990s. It's really is that bad. But rather appropriately for today as well, the big one is this reliability issue, and that's probably and it's this reliability thing which is why. Drones are just got, are getting such a bad press at the moment. And to be honest, a lot of it entirely justified as well. So, I mean, the biggest problem is, is the operators. By definition, unskilled, very generally amateur as well. And I can't, and, and a, this is definitely an avionics issue. Because A320, it's got all sorts of gates built around it, it needs to, and that compensates for pilot, pilot mistakes. That technology and the drone side of things is still relatively immature. We've got a long way to go. So we've got the operator problem, so system level problems. But even more fundamental than that, we've still got very, very simple basic systems with very little resilience in them as well. The code, as I say, it's generally well written, but there's plenty of flaky code out there as well. It's, to give you an example, I was trying to uh, compile autopilot code the other day with a very particular configuration for a drone we're developing at UWE, and wouldn't compile for that particular configuration. That sort of concept would never slip through a well-maintained build and test procedure and things like that. So there are holes. And of course the argument, and it's quite a reasonable one, is well, you go ahead and fix it. We can't get around the fact that this is still consumer based. So we've got all that fa basic flakiness. If I drop my mobile phone, it'll break. Same happens to a lesser extent with these drones. And we've also got simplex architecture. What does that mean? I'll talk about it in a minute. I know there's lack of redundancy. So I want to talk about that systems level thing and reliability. But to do that, I just want to give a little bit of background, take a little step back and just define what I mean by reliability firstly. This is a slide I show to my students every single avionics course that I give. <coughs> and the important thing to remember about reliability, it comes in two flavours. We've got the availability, which is probably what everybody thinks of as reliability. In other words, the thing does what it wants when you ask it to. But avionics, and here's the key point, avionics has to have that extra, extra property as well of integrity. What does that mean? It doesn't do what you don't want it to do. So that can be an, ex an example of that can be it doesn't fly over my house, it doesn't fly off out of the airfield if I lose track of it and things like that. And this integrity thing is absolutely key to avionics in general and it's something that it's pretty bad in drone avionics at the moment. And that's why we're finding drones drifting out into airports and things like that. So how do we go about ensuring availability and integrity? Generally, availability is done by redundancy. You can imagine, so we've got a switching device, turn on motor on, it overheats, it stops working. If if there's no redundancy, if there isn't a second device to control that motor, the thing will fall out of the sky. And therein lies another problem. Look at the airframe itself. It's fundamentally lacking in, in redundancy. But if we had two of those power controllers, the thing could stay in the air and no one would be any the wiser. Integrity is more sophisticated. Generally, we need comparison systems. We need monitoring systems that check and override the main control systems in order to keep them on the straight and narrow. So those are two parts to this same thing really, to this reliability issue. So let's just take a think about that. Let's just think about this, this, this redundancy thing and about integrity in more detail. Here we've got our basic system. So this is what's pretty much in my mobile phone or in my drone. It's crashed over there. It's got low availability and low integrity. I can't be sure that it's not going to run a mark any more than I can be sure that it's going to um, switch off, switch itself off and fail. 
So I can boost the availability by going to a duplex system. I can have two of them. So if one fails, I can switch the other one in. However, we're already paying something of a heavy price. We've obviously duplicated the system itself, but we've also got to have some sort of channel select system as well. And that's going to introduce reliability issues as well. So this is a slide that I often show for my avionics courses. So generally, we're, we're trying to boost availability and integrity as well. And there's various ways of doing that. There's the common architecture, where essentially we've got duplication, but within each channel, we have a command system, we have a monitor system, one that says it's OK to do it. There's other ways of doing that as well. There's uh, triplex systems as well. And uh, different, different aerospace organisations tend to go for different different ways of solving this particular issue. I mean, for example, it's worth noting that the Predator's flight control system is a triplex redundant system in order to get that, which is obviously a long way ahead of what we've got in our drones here. So it all adds up to accidents are happening and breakdowns are happening. And so let's look at some of those reasons of how, they, how it does occur. Big one, pilot loss of situational awareness. It's, it's something you hear about a lot with military UAV drones. Predators are going in all the time because the pilot gets lost. And in fact, if, you're, if you try and fly a drone through a, a display, which I can organise for you if you're interested in doing that, you find that, yes, it requires a quite a feat of concentration to keep the thing not only under control, well, control's easy, but managing its position properly and not flying into something you don't realise is there and understanding where it is. The big one as well you see a lot is the wireless connection breaks down. I showed, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, we're using these consumer links, which are good enough for consumer communications. But we've got an interesting problem. If we want to move up from that 99% reliability to 99.999%, which is the sort of numbers we need for robust avionics systems, um, they just won't cut the ice. Or oh, We need some sort of backup or resilience built in. Loss of control in gusting conditions, typical one. In other words, the control system just isn't physically, it, sorry, isn't sophisticated enough for the environment in which it's been operated. So uh, that becomes an issue, is, is that avionics or is it an operational issue? A bit of both, really. Changes to airframe. Yeah, it's all too easy to make a modification to my drone. And as I say, I'm using standard software, which I'm just reconfiguring. And it's all too easy just to try something out. And so uh, without a rigorous flight test program like we're used to with conventional aircraft, And so, effectively what I'm saying is it's too cheap, it's too easy to make changes and, and not fully recertify the aircraft properly. So the final three bullets is the old criminals of reliability, connectors, electrical systems breaking, and mechanical things physically breaking, cracks, wires breaking, things delaminating all the usual culprits. So I mentioned, uh, I talked about some numbers earlier, and this is a rather interesting graph I've put together. You could argue it's a little bit misleading because of course we've got a little fixed wing at this end of the graph and rotary down here, but in fact if, you, if we look at uh, fixed wing drones down here as well, the same is also true. It'd be very, very interesting to see if I could get some numbers for things like the Fire Scout, which is the um, rotary UAV that the Americans are using at the moment. But the fact is that it's this very interesting geometric increase in price, yielding a geometric increase in reliability, MTB8 mean time between accidents. So the other interesting point about this as well is if you look at the numbers, a Predator and an F-16 manned aircraft are effectively have got identical reliability figures compared to both an AR drone and my little H2O there that so I was flying a minute ago. In the, I say the same numbers in the same way that the, the Earth and the Moon are the same as compared to a golf ball and an orange. So 
So that leads on to the question of, well, how much reliability have we got in these systems and how much do we need? And here's the shocking res reply to that at the moment is nobody knows to either question, don't know and don't know. And in fact, it's something that I'm very eager to look into, into how much reliability have we got in these systems? And also, where's those, where are those easy wins of where, we, where can we increase reliability or demonstrate reliability very, very quickly in the future? So I'm running out of time now, but a little interesting war story of where some of this experience has really shown itself was the IMEC -E UAS challenge that the UE entered last year, along with 11 other universities. In fact, we're, we're off next month to the 2016 event, We're looking forward to it. There's a, we, as you can see, we've actually gone with, for a fixed wing solution here. The thing was very stable, but along with all the other entries, and I do mean all the other entries, we suffered from endless system reliability problems, all the nature of those ones I've been talking about in the previous slide. <laughs> we had battery fires, but we didn't. Other people had battery fires. We had people with overheating switching devices and no redundancy, so things fell out of the sky. Our particular crime was we forgot to put the washers on nuts during rigging, and the engine tore itself off like a rotten tooth. Everybody managed to come up with new and interesting ways of failing their system reliability requirements. So very, very interesting background. If, you're, if you want to hear more about that, please get in touch fascinating experience and it's coming up next month. So with that in mind, just to, let's just sum up really. The fact is we need to increase reliability of these consumer prosumer drones to an appropriate level and as I say, what is appropriate level? That needs defining as well. There is a lot of work going on, it won't surprise you to hear, at CAA and a lot of people worrying a lot about how much reliability we need. The, the regulations that do exist at the moment are very, very vague and people are spending a lot of time wondering about how to firm those up. So we need, some, we need more reliability. How are we going to get there and how much we need? TBD. And my, uh, my thesis, and this is speaking as somebody who spent his 25 years doing this for a living, was I think we need to say, take some, some, of the methods, testing systems and tools from conventional avionics to do this. So I, my particular party trick over the years was hardware in the loop testing. And I can, for, and that would be a perfect example of somewhere where we need to start. There's that vast middle ground in that several orders of magnitude of cost stroke reliability, which is populated by a handful of both prosumer and military devices, which would be very interesting to explore, as well as these very, very basic machines which are getting in people's way at the moment. But on a, on a lighter note, it's important to understand that there's a lot of easy wins to be had in improving this technology. For relatively small efforts, we can increase reliability and we can measure reliability and we can regulate reliability in the future. So I hope that's been a useful lesson for you to take away. That drones at the moment, I like to think of, when I see that one of those quadcopters flying, I think that's the Wright Brothers flyer. We've got a long way to go to get to Concorde A380 or whatever you think of it as. But thank you very much. And any questions, please uh, get in touch. <laughs>